Good morning. My name is Perry Green. <laughs> and for those of you that hide your Easter eggs, I am your preacher. <laughs> so, uh, for those that are visiting, I uh, have been out of town, out of uh, pocket for the last four Sundays. Our elders have given me, or had given me a uh, time of sabbatical to uh, help me focus and to deal with some grief issues. My wife passed away about, uh, well, March, about six months ago. And so um, I was trying to deal with those issues, and finally the elders said, you need to get away. And uh, <clears throat> so they gave me a month to, uh, to go away and to focus and to uh, begin dealing with some of these issues in a, a more positive way. So I want you to know <clears throat> that progress, <clears throat> excuse me, progress is being made in me. And I want to thank the elders for this time off. I was pretty reluctant, and, and what, let me just back up a second. What I'd like to do for just a few minutes before we do the lesson is just kind of fill you in on some of the things <clears throat> the last four, for the last four weeks for me. And so I, I, just, I do want to thank the elders for giving me the time to do this. I was reluctant at first to do it for a lot of reasons. Uh, but after I got away, and uh, actually about a week after I got away, uh, I started finding the value to this time. This was not a wasted sabbatical, and, and by the way, it was not a vacation. I want you to know that. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of hard work in this, and the only way that I could have done this was to have been able to go away. So elders, thank you for actually kind of insisting that I do this. <clears throat> so thank you. Thank you to the guys that filled in for me, for Joe Wallace and Gene Newberry and Lynn Groves and Barry Stump. I uh, appreciate you guys stepping up and, and filling in. <clears throat> the downside of this, these guys filling in, is that I have tried for nearly 12 years to convince you that I am indispensable. <laughs> <laughs> and now you know that's not true, <laughs> that I am expendable, but I just don't want to be expended. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so thank you guys for filling in, and thank you for the opportunity for me to go away. I want to thank the congregation, you all, uh, as well in this. You've been very patient and very encouraging to me. Uh, even as I was gone for those few days, uh, you had, uh, many of you sent me texts and emails. Uh, when I got home, there were cards, hard copy cards in my box um, uh, to encourage me, and I just thank you for that. Uh, some of you uh, helped finance my trip, and I appreciate you for being willing to, uh, to help me along the way, the cheer basket and the cards that were in that. Really appreciate it, but most of all, I appreciate your prayers. Uh, there's no question that I felt your prayers <clears throat> on this trip, and I, I want you to know how much I appreciate that, as, uh, as this was really a challenge to me. It's something I've never done before in, in doing a sabbatical like this uh, with a lot of focus and a lot of purpose behind it, <clears throat> not just getting away to read a book. Uh, now, I want you to understand <clears throat> that these four weeks were a, a, a month of discovery and hard work for me. Now, I have five file folders here, and I don't know if you can tell the, the thickness, <laughs> but um, I worked um, nearly, you know, I worked every day for the last four weeks with a variety of things. I've started journaling. It's kind of a diary and some insight kinds of things. I've never done that before. I um, uh, tried it a few times, but it just, I just didn't click with me. But on this trip, <clears throat> I started journaling. In fact, I, I started my journal the day before I began the, uh, the sabbatical. Uh, included in this packet is not only my journal notes, but as I told you, not only did I go through grief share, a grief share class, and by the way, we're starting a grief share class tomorrow night. If you know of anybody who may need to deal with their grief, encourage them to come to our class. It is helpful. In addition to that, a counselor friend of mine who lives in Texas 
has been coaching me with some of the grief issues, some of the emotions and various things that, that are attached to grief. And I've made some insight, discoveries and in, have some insights into the grief process that I never dreamed of before. Uh, I have conducted about, or no, over a hundred funerals in my career. I, I, I don't know the exact number, but I know it's over a hundred. And I thought I understood the grief process. I, I've watched some of you <clears throat> as you have lost a loved one, and I've watched you as you dealt with the loss, as you mourned, and as you began to bounce back from the loss. What I didn't know was what was personal and at home and some of the issues with which you were dealing. And those of you that are on this journey right now, this grief journey, you understand that you don't get it until you get it, until you have to go through it. So I learned some things. I'm going to share some of those things with the Grief Share class as it is appropriate some new insights and new understandings, but let me tell you this, and I knew this before I left, <clears throat> but I had time to really work through this. The only source of cure, if you want to call it cure, the only source of healing in regard to grief is God. Okay? So we can go through, uh, go away to wherever and so on, but you've got you to gotta get God in the mix. God is the source of healing. God is the source of comfort and, and all of that. Your encouragement is wonderful. I appreciate it, and I know the other folks that are dealing with their losses appreciate your interest, your concern, your care for them, just like I do. But you've got to get to God. And that's one of the things that Grief Share really talks about. You've got to tell the story. And I told my story in writing in a lot of ways. So I've got my journaling, I've got my counseling notes, I have over 20 sermon ideas that uh, kind of popped in during the, uh, the time that I was away, and I intend to, to, to work on those in the next few weeks and share some of those with you. Uh, what else? I have some ideas for our congregation, so elders, let me uh, ask you to begin praying about the things that... Uh, that I'm going to be presenting to you in the next, uh, next elders meeting that I'm a part of. And uh, we'll see if it came from God or if it was just from bad fish. <laughs> so uh, so uh, we'll, uh, but, I, but I want to do that and I want to share some of those ideas. And hopefully as we go along, uh, we're going to be seeing and hearing more and more from God through this process. I traveled over 3,500 miles on this trip. Went through 11 states, uh, stayed in some of them, obviously. I got to see my mom and one of my brothers, uh, st saw Laura and her family, my daughter and her family in Arkansas. Went on to, uh, went through Mississippi at, to, to stop at a place that I'd wanted to see for a while. Went through Alabama up to uh, Tennessee and saw Linda's parents uh, for just a brief visit. Then went on and visited with my mom and my brother. Went down to Florida and then uh, spent some time there where I grew up. And then from there, I went back up and um, went through Alabama again and uh, back to Arkansas and back here and took a, a little side trip to Texas to visit with my counselor friend. Uh, I visited with one friend along the way. I didn't want too many people knowing about my trip. I wanted most of that time to be God and me. And so I didn't really tell a lot of folks that I was coming, but I did get to visit with one good friend and uh, spend a little time there. Uh, on the way back, I uh, visited with my daughter on the way back, <clears throat> and then I had learned about a prayer conference in Little Rock. Left her house and headed for the prayer conference to get to the hotel uh, for the prayer conference, and on the way down, I was sideswiped <laughs> by a very large uh, van and, um, and so I had a little uh, adrenaline rush, and that was kind of fun. But uh, uh, the car is scuffed up. It wasn't crunched. It was just kind of scuffed up, and we've got uh, insurance stuff going on for that.
And uh, so hopefully uh, as we get in, in, into the, those things, we'll get all that fixed. Came home and had plumbing problems, air conditioning problems, got another, got another leak I found this morning. So, uh, so there's, uh, there's real life involved in all of this as well. Uh, one other thing, uh, then I want to very briefly talk about Isaiah chapter 53 with you. And I don't think I'm going to use the slides, I might, but I think I'm just, I just want to talk to you a minute about Isaiah 53. But um, one of the, the good things about being away and uh, being able to be focused is to kind of begin understanding what David said in Psalm 46, where God said, be still and know that I am God. Um, in, the, in the regular, everyday life, it's hard to do that. And somehow, we have to carve out time to be able to stop and breathe and let God be God. Because most of the time, I want to be God. I want to drive the chariot. I want to be in charge. I want to do what I want to do. But God is the source of all comfort. God is the source of peace. God is the source of all that we are and all that we have. And sometimes I have to just be still and know. I'm not in charge. If I was in charge, things would be a lot different. But I'm not in charge. And that's good. Because I'd mess it up. <laughs> I don't have to understand everything that has happened. I don't have to understand everything that God does or everything that God allows. I just have to trust God. He's the one that's got it under control. And that's all I need to know. Fear God and keep His commandments. This is the whole of man. So as we, uh, as we journey together, we simply trust God and follow the things that He teaches us, and the ways that He leads us. And we just try to do our best in being faithful to Him. That's all we can do. God doesn't require perfection. He requires faithfulness. That's all. And you can be faithful to God. You can be faithful to God even when it doesn't feel good. When, when Moses gave the great commandment in, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. All the time. Not just when it feels good. <clears throat> Not just when things are going your way. Because the truth is, you've either been through a tragedy, or going through a tragedy, or you will go through a tragedy. And the solution to your tragedy is the God above and the God within. So, let me wrap this up, and then we'll talk very briefly about Isaiah 53. <clears throat> Thank you again for giving me, allowing me this time away for your encouragement and for your um, lifting me up. You know, Moses lifted his hands and... and uh, uh, Joshua and, 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 and her held, held the hands up for Moses, or uh, Aaron and her held the hands up for Moses while Joshua and the Israelites did battle in the, in the valley. You've been holding my hands up. Uh, I'm not Moses. Um, I'm a Moses wannabe, I guess, but, uh, but I, uh, I appreciate your, your holding me up. And your prayers have been huge in this process. So please continue to pray for me as well as others who are dealing with similar issues. But now let's look at Isaiah 53 for just a moment. <clears throat> and I, I want to note, I want us to, <laughs> very few minutes, I want us to notice uh, a few things from Isaiah 53. Because this is a powerful chapter in the Bible. One of the most powerful chapters in the whole book. Uh, the Ethiopian was reading this chapter when Philip came along beside, and Philip said to him, do you understand what you're reading? And the, the eunuch says, how can I except somebody teach me, guide me, show me? 
And so he starts at the same passage that the Ethiopian was reading, and he begins preaching Jesus to him. And as you read this chapter, you easily see, because you know the story, you easily see that this is talking about Jesus. There are some rabbis today, Jewish rabbis, who don't believe in Jesus, who don't want their congregations reading Isaiah 53. Because if they read Isaiah 53, they might make the connection of who Jesus really is. And so let's read a little bit in Isaiah, starting at verse 53. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Arm of the Lord is a Messiah reference. Look at verse 2. For he, the arm of the Lord, for he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or comeliness that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He's just a plain guy. You know, if, 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 I, was, if I was Jesus coming into the world, I think I'd want to look pretty. I'd want to I'd try to spiff up and make people want to look at me and want to hang around me just because I was good looking. That's not what God does. And it didn't what he did with Jesus. He was just a regular guy. No beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. How did it feel when you have been rejected by people? How does it feel when somebody has despised you? Last time this happened to me, a little group of people who didn't really know me decided that uh, I should be rejected and despised. And I got to tell you, it caught me off guard when that happened. I mean, that doesn't happen to me, at least very often, to just be tossed aside without really knowing me. I mean, it's like the old song, you know, to, to know, know, know me is to love, love, love me, right? You guys know me and love me or like me, at least tolerate me. And, uh, and so here I've, I'm rejected, despised. But then it occurred to me, this is good. Because in this rejection, I get a little minuscule, tiny feeling of what Jesus feels when he is despised and rejected by men. And if you think about it, over the years there have been billions of people who have despised and rejected Jesus. I wonder how that makes him feel. For people to come along and just turn their backs on Jesus. For people to just reject him outright. And largely, the reason people reject Him is because they don't know Him. Because to know Him is to love Him. And if I don't know Jesus, it's real easy to reject Him. But how could you reject the one who loves you to the level that He loves you? If you know Him. If you get to know Him for who He is. He was despised and rejected by men He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. But now let's read on. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that made us whole. And with his stripes we are healed. The cross is very important to us because of the sin factor. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But don't forget that the cross is also important because you have grief and you have sorrow and you have been bruised within yourself. When you're rejected by people, when you're despised by people, when you have sorrow of various kinds, there is a bruising to who you are that happens. 
And Jesus was bruised. Jesus was beaten. Jesus was here to carry your grief and your sorrow and your suffering as well as your sin. When we pass the Lord's Supper at this place, you have three options in the plate of bread. You have a pellet that is just a regular unleavened pellet. You have a gluten-free pellet. Or you have a piece of the matzah bread. Personally, I like to break off a piece of the matzah. And one of the reasons that I prefer that is because when I look at that piece of matzah, I get a clearer picture of Jesus than just a little pellet. On that piece of matzah bread, it is unleavened. It doesn't rise when it's baked. It's like a cracker. Those of you that have been to the Passover uh, Seder with me, you know what this is. That this is related to the Passover. You know that Jesus at that Passover meal picked up that unleavened bread, and whether it was shaped like ours or not, doesn't matter. But he picked up that unleavened bread and he said, this is my body. Eat this and remember me. That unleavened bread says there's no sin in Jesus. But if you look closer at our unleavened bread, you will notice there are stripes baked into that bread. And there are puncture marks, there are holes in that matzah. By His stripes, we are healed. And those piercings that happened to Jesus, whether it was a crown of thorns, the Roman whip, the nails that pierced His hands and feet, or the spear that pierced His side, those holes remind us of what He went through. Jesus gives us healing. Sometimes it's physical. Sometimes it's emotional. And all the time it's spiritual. But that was part of the cross experience for us. That He came to to bear our grief, to bear our sorrows, to bear our suffering. We do grieve as believers in Jesus. Paul reminds us that we grieve, but we don't grieve like those who have no hope. We grieve differently. Because we have hope. We have hope for now that God is going to work in us and make us better. And we have hope for later to reunite with those that have passed on. We might always bear the scars of whatever we're going through. Those scars may be there the rest of our lives. But God is there to say it's okay. It's all right. I'm walking with you. It's going to be okay. And we'll get through this together. But I want us to notice very, very quickly the last part, or at least a few more verses of chapter 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He came to carry our griefs and our sorrows, but he also came to take away the iniquity that we have, have committed. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked. And with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Now notice this, verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when he makes himself an offering for sin. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Who killed Jesus? Well, you know, the Jews turned him over to the Romans and the Romans nailed him to the cross. No, God did it. God made Jesus into our sin offering. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, Paul reminds us about 
the seriousness of sin. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither sexual immorality, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Listen to what he tells them. And such were some of you. But you are washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. In 2 Corinthians 5, he says, He made him to be sin who knew no sin. That cross is the sin offering for us. I don't know what your sin might be. Whatever you might be struggling with, Jesus is the sin offering for your sin. Not just some generic sin, but He is the offering for you for your specific sin. He came to take your griefs, your sorrows, and your separation from God and to bear your personal, real sin, whatever it is, and to be that offering. Don't you love Jesus for what He's done for us? What a great gift God gave. Paul says again in Romans chapter 8, Now therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ today, smile. You're not condemned. Your burden has been lifted because you cast all your care on Him because He cares for you. I want to ask you to stand and we're going to pray. And then following the prayer, we're going to sing an invitation song. Our Father in heaven, we honor you today for who you are. For the God who gave us Jesus to lift our burdens and to take away our sin and our guilt. So today, Father, as we recognize that in you we have no condemnation, lift us that we might walk closely with you. Relieve our hearts, pick up our sins, carry those burdens that we've been carrying and enlighten our load, casting all our cares on you, recognizing your yoke is easy, your burden is light. So Father, thank you for what you've done for us in Jesus and for this time we've shared. In his name we pray, amen. This morning, if you need to respond publicly to the invitation, either to become a Christian, to put Christ on in baptism where there is no condemnation for your sin, we invite you to do that. If you need prayer, we want to encourage you to come also. So if you need to come now, come as we sing together.